Welcome to the Running For Real podcast, where each week we bring you a conversation designed to help you create positive change in your life, community and planet. It's a collective of conversations about running, the climate emergency and social justice. Running For Real is for the brave, for those with courage and vulnerability. United by our love of running, we're driving momentum towards some of the really tough challenges we're facing as humanity. So come join me, Tina Muir, and let's get started. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 258 of the Running Through a Podcast. If this is your first time being here, thank you for joining me today. If this is your 258th, thank you. Welcome back. And uh, we have a special one for you today. I am excited to tell you a bit more. But firstly, this is potentially the biggest guest we've had on this show. Um, And there was a lot of lessons that came from this experience for me. Primarily that it's okay to be persistent. It's okay to keep trying to do the things that we want to do and keep finding ways. If we want it enough, we will find a way. However, As with many things, I think a lot of the lessons that come from it is be persistent, try, but then let it go. See what happens, trust that things will happen. And that certainly was the case with my guest today. Now, today I'm excited to welcome Malcolm Gladwell to the podcast. You may have heard of his name from his podcast, Revisionist History, which is a very popular show. Um, You may have heard of him from one of his seven best-selling books. Uh, Outliers is one of the the well-known ones, as well as David and Goliath, um, and my personal favorite, Talking to Strangers. He just released a new one called The Bomber Mafia. And he is just known for one being one of the creative thinkers, one of the voices of our time. He's also, as you may guess, a runner. Uh, I had the pleasure of going for a run with him after this recording and it was awesome other than I did get stung by a bee near my eye and it swelled up for five days but you know the price you pay right so today I want to introduce you to Malcolm Gladwell and after a quick word from one of our sponsors we will be right to that episode Thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. Athletic Greens, I've been taking it for years. I take it every single morning. It is the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning. Although I have mentioned before, I am incredibly lazy when it comes to washing lids of bottles. So they give you the shaker bottle and I tend to just put my hand over the end and give it a shake. However, more times than I can count, uh, my hand has slipped and Athletic Greens has gone all over the place, leaving nice green marks um, on everything. Uh, But obviously it's easy to clean up. But yeah, I just wanted to be real there that quite often I throw my athletic greens all over the wall or all over the couch or all over the floor uh, because I fill it all the way to the top with ice cold water put that um, scoop in and then give it a shake and by the way I do recommend ice cold water that is how I drink it and people seem to enjoy that as well now seven you get 75 vitamins minerals whole food source ingredients in every scoop it's going to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet one scoop is going to give you potent daily support for energy gut health immunity and recovery it is nsf certified for sport they have been obsessively working on the formulation and it is trusted by many pro athletes and health experts they have a 60-day money money back guarantee not that you will need it and every serving every uh, scoop you use gives you the antioxidant equivalent of 12 servings of fruits and vegetables so it covers you on those five crucial areas of health Uh, Tim Ferriss it is his favorite supplement Uh, you will hear all kinds of people talking about um, athletic greens how much they use it Um, I'm of course one of them and I love hearing your reviews come in about Athletic Greens and how much you are enjoying it. You can go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to get yourself a one year free supply of vitamin D and you can also get some free travel packs with that subscription. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to go check it out now. Hi friends, just a quick note to say that today I changed the interview style a little bit more. Malcolm has been interviewed so many times. I wanted it to be more of a conversation. I wanted him to feel comfortable and to be able to talk about some of the more difficult things. So this conversation is more of a conversation rather than an interview. 
I really enjoyed doing it this way uh, and I hope you do too. So let's go meet him. Malcolm, yes. welcome to the Running For Real podcast. Thank you. I have to ask first, uh-huh. this is going to make me feel really uncomfortable. Had you, have you ever heard of the Running For Real podcast? You can well, be I to have say no. because <laughs> I've been told about it. By? By David Epstein, among others. Good. Which is why I'm here. Mm-hmm. By Dave, because of David? Was it Knox? I think it was David Epstein. Okay. Well, who thank my you to old David. Running companion, yes. Who, who, when David says I should do something, I tend to do it. Okay. That's good to know for future, David Epstein. I'm coming for you for, <laughs> for a lot. No, actually, that actually leads in nicely to how I wanted to start this, which is that. I saw a tweet from Steve Magnus, I believe, mm-hmm. and it was saying about you versus Cal Newport versus Ryan Holiday versus Brad Stolberg and David. Yes. And I noticed that there was that's five men, uh-huh. and I would like to add myself to the list in this 400. You, Can I you, add myself to this list? Yeah, what were we racing? <laughs> what distance? I think it's at a 400. Which is oh, well, pretty I'm intimidating. Last. So I, <laughs> I, my interest level. Although I thought Ryan Holiday was was he a he was a sprinter in. I'm not sure. I talked to, actually went on his podcast. Too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, you're more than welcome to join. Um, just so long as um, uh, yes. In fact, okay. add more. Let's add more to the list. Okay. More than All right, then think of some on the spot. Who else can we add? <laughs> um, well, I just don't know enough about <laughs> running, you know, and 400 is such a kind of particular oh, no. That's a very interesting choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was surprised he didn't do something more extravagant. <laughs> like what? A donut run or a, like a... You know, like a, like a 10 miler or something 10 miler. to really separate. Okay. You know, the... Do you feel like you'd have a better chance in the 10 mile or the 400? No. Well, David will win the 400. Okay. Uh, even, I would think, since he was a... 49.4 meter. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Than that in the, okay. in the day. Fair. Um, and he's also very young. Mm-hmm. He's in his mid thirties. So, um, and the question is, will I disgrace myself? I feel I'll disgrace myself less in a 400 than in a 15 okay. mile. All right. Well, I want to make that happen someday. Um, my next part of my running journey is all about just picking random things and having fun with it. So I feel like that would be a fun thing to do someday. Um, so, you know, you, you have been a lifelong runner. Um, I think, I think I might start with something that I feel is, um, interesting. And actually my husband, who's a college coach picked up, which is that, um, you've been known to say often that you knew at 16, you went in the 5% that were going to, you know, be an Olympian or be successful. And I'm curious, like one, how did you know that? Or what did you think you knew that? like what your limit was when you obviously weren't at the mileage or maybe you were mm. that you could have potentially reached your body maybe wasn't developed to where it would be. So what gave you the, 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 I don't want to say the confidence, but the decision to know that when you had so many running years ahead of you and do you, would you change it now? Well, I would change it now because I now realize what a colossal mistake I made not running in my prime years. I basically mm-hmm. stopped running it. 16 and never raced again until I was 50. Mm-hmm. So that seems crazy in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think I was wrong. There's no way I would, would have been a world class runner. Mm-hmm. Um, I ran against someone who later turned out to be a, I ran against two guys mm-hmm. who later turned out to be 350, 335, 1500 meter runners. Mm-hmm. They were my two contemporaries when I was running. And it was clear to me at the age of 13 and 14 and 15. That they were, even though I could beat them at that age, mm-hmm. I had no confidence that I would be able to beat them beyond that age. In other words, they, they struck me as being clearly superior to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am, you know, you, you're very, you're very, at that age, I feel like we're all very, very, we're students of these minor gradations in ability. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're doing this in multiple areas of your life. You're deciding in math class whether you're someone wants to pursue math, right? You're deciding whether you're all these things you decide. And so you get you look very closely. And I I also didn't feel I was and I still don't believe I'm temperamentally suited to be a elite runner. Mm-hmm. I just I'm a not a very good racer. Mm-hmm. I, uh, so I, I would argue your most recent race. Well no that was not, <laughs> that's a good sample. Um but I get way too nervous mm-hmm. and were you nervous that day? 
before right oh yeah, yeah yeah way too nervous i mean i my my performance was massively impaired by the fact that i hadn't slept the night before i mean it was you know because of nerves yeah it was really it was totally like right. because I mean, of the hype so for anyone listening this is the race against chris chavez it was uh you're both trying to break five i believe but also yeah. trying to beat one another um nervous in terms of just the hype that was around it no i'm always nervous mm. before races when i was a kid running in high school i would start to get nervous several weeks before major meets mm -hmm. and it's only gotten worse with time mm. and you can't you know it means i run i race very very rarely because i just because it just tortures me mm -hmm. um i'm fine in the race and i'm fine after the race but I'm, but the, mm, the know, one hour before the, the, the 48 hours before okay. are painful. Wow. Um, and that's not sustainable. Um, and I also felt I was as a kid way too, maybe this was wrong, injury prone to be a, mm. um, but it were all I, a number of reasons, which I don't doubt. I, um, I would, ne you know, I would have been a comfortably sub elite runner perhaps if I pursued it in my twenties, which I wish I'd done. That would have been really fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was never going to, you know, I was never going to medal at the national championship. So, but then don't you see a lot of runners who do seem to be pretty average, but then they, some like in the, you know, late twenties, early thirties kind of rise up and, and seem to reach that next level. Yeah. There's not a lot on the male side. That's true. It is I mean, I feel like yeah. with women, it's very different just because of the, the particularities of, Mm. female maturation right mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is a hump in your early 20s and then you either get over the hump or you don't mm -hmm. and so it, it introduces this kind of fascinating thing yeah and also i i wish i knew more about it but i'm fascinated by all of these women running in their mid to late 30s running as well or better than they'd ever run mm -hmm. at the elite level like sarah hall or mm -hmm, something like that mm -hmm. i don't know is there a male i can't think of a male equivalent to that that's really interesting to me yeah um i think that might be f female specific yeah have you ever read anything about that like what i mean i'm sure someone listening has read some if you haven't but um that is interesting to think that yeah it is women um but it brings up this larger thing is i don't know that it, we and there are many people who know more about this than me but i'm not convinced that the physical degradation in your 30s and 40s is as great as we think it is. I think mm. it's mostly a motivational mm. degradation or just a life degradation or an injury proneness. Like, I don't think that I was, I now have been running hard again for seven years. Mm -hmm. So I started running properly again when I was maybe 49, 50. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge amount of difference in that seven years. I mean, a little bit but of improvement or like degradation, no, degradation. Mm. i mean i look at my workouts that i was running at 51 they don't look a lot different from the workouts i'm running at 57. Mm -hmm. um so you'd think there's you know the, the tables and charts and theories would tell you there should be quite a drop off yeah but i i don't see it and i'm wondering mm -hmm. do we just exaggerate or would that be that you had such a long break like i'd love uh, your opinion on you know, there's this theory of whether runners have a certain number of miles in their body. And because you had that big break, mm -hmm. like, had you been running the entire time, do you think it would have been yeah. exaggerated? I mean, maybe I was running, I, I would run, I just didn't run consistently mm -hmm. or train like hard. hard workouts. Yeah. Um, and I was physically active. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the big thing was getting healthy. Um, that was the trick. But now I seem to have it seems to me that be staying healthy in my fifties is not harder than it was staying healthy in my teens. It seems to be easier. Well, a lot of people listening to that will be happy to hear that. Because <laughs> um, I had real trouble staying healthy. As a mm. And what do you attribute that to now? Well, it was the seventies. <laughs> That's how old I am. There's only one approach um, in the seventies. <laughs> and we didn't know anything. I mean, mm. you know, there's so much we didn't, you know, we were obsessed with, we thought that the answer to every problem in the seventies was orthotics. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this? Well, I don't remember this now because I wasn't alive. You, yeah. alive. <laughs> but, I mean, you heard of this, like, yeah. which seems really weird in retrospect. It was everything was about you would spend mm -hmm. thousands of dollars these mm -hmm. things to fix mm -hmm. all your problems. In fact, now we realize mm -hmm. it's just not about orthotics. No. Um, and uh, I don't know. I just didn't. 
seems now we're just all, we're just so much smarter about that kind of stuff. So do, uh, do you geek out over all the Strava stats and the all the data that's available now, or do you try and stay away from it? Oh no, totally geek out. It's, really fun. <laughs> it's half the fun. Um, you know, I like uh, I it appeals to my kind of um, uh, what's the best way uh, obsessive nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, it's a lot more fun to do. A, on Friday, I did 10 times 200. So it's fun to do 10 times 200. Mm-hmm. It's even more fun to say I did 10 times 200 between, <laughs> you know, 36 and 33. Right? Yeah, I agree. It's just more interesting. Mm-hmm. It's like the first one is a anecdote. The second one is a story. Mm-hmm. I believe in stories over anecdotes. Yeah, so, so. true. I love that. Um, and then, so we said about the nerves. I'd love to just talk to that for a second. Do you think... Is there any part that, because you stopped at 16, had you continued racing, running, racing and doing hard workouts, maybe that would have subsided? Or do you think that's kind of the person you are that you were always going to be? I think it's a person. I mean, it's not that I'm opposed to, I always, even then and now, much, you know, I will happily do an incredibly hard workout. I have no, Mm -hmm. um, I have no anxiety about that. Mm -hmm. on the contrary, mm-hmm. I sort of thrive in it. Thrive in it, mm. but for some reason, racing is just it is, has been this uniquely. Sometimes scared of it. It's just it just makes me anxious. Yeah. It just. Are there any other things in life that make you that anxious? Almost nothing. Really. Um, like so even I, like speaking or no the opposite. Speaking. Huh. You could tell me that Malcolm in twenty minutes you have to address a group of five thousand people. As long as so. I, you know, like everyone, I was initially, I do a lot of speaking and mm-hmm. I was initially, I would get a little anxious about it, but then I realized I can conquer this hundred percent with preparation. Mm-hmm. That anxiety to me anyway, about speaking was just about, um, the idea that I didn't know exactly what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and once I realized, oh, if I just do my homework, I'm fine. But can you take that same approach to running though? No, I can't. That's the problem. Have you worked with a sports psychologist? I never have. Perhaps I should. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that might be yeah. the secret. Yeah. Because then you would maybe enjoy that. Yeah. Build up a bit more. No, I ran. So I, mm. I raced two weeks ago. I did a team triathlon, a relay, triathlon yep. relay. I was a runner. I had a... Oh, so you each did a leg. Yeah. Okay. I was, I was, we had a swimmer, we had a cyclist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I did not get nervous at all about that. Now, there was no expectation that we were going to win, but the presence of two others... Mm removed all of the yeah. tension for me. Um, so that was interesting. I hadn't thought about like So I played with the format and my nervousness went away. Now, I also didn't run terribly. I mean, I ran reasonably hard, but I wasn't kind of killing myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, the, but the race against Rich Chavez, Chris Chavez a month ago, I was profoundly nervous. And have now, have, as a result, have all kinds of regrets about the race because feel I raced really badly. I mean, I could have run so much faster. But I was you sandbagged. So, I wasn't sandbagged. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing, you know, I was, I was trying to psych, was I trying to psych him out a little bit? Sure, but that's my, that's my problem. But you went on his shoulder, so it wasn't like you were like really trying to psych him out. Well, I, I was trying to mess with his head beforehand. Oh, I see. Okay. And I don't think I did. <laughs> um, but I, that was part of the fun. Mm-hmm. But I just... I got so nervous that I lacked all of my training set. I really should have been able to run five minutes. Mm-hmm. And all I had to do was to attach myself to someone who I actually knew was going to be running around five minutes. I knew that person was. And then it, I had this kind of crisis of confidence and I didn't do that. And that cost me a really good PR. So what do you think you could have run? Five minutes. Really? Mm-hmm. I mean, my training, I looked at all of my training and I was right around five minutes. You know, mm-hmm. you can sort of. I was very, very comfortable at that pace, you know, my racing, all my training beforehand. And I still, you know, I'm six weeks out. I still am doing workouts and I'm still super comfortable at that pace. So okay. um, I could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a beautiful night. It was mm-hmm. a fantastic mm-hmm. track. I had those super spikes. I mean, mm-hmm. the whole thing was all lined up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, if you gave me a s- six weeks, I think I could maybe challenge you in that. 
I think I'd need don't, some. Don't say you're challenging me. You're making me nervous. <laughs> you could say, Malcolm, I could I would... pull you <laughs> to five minutes. I don't know if that's still in there, for, but maybe. Um, okay, so I'd love to um, – I – Actually, a friend of mine told me um, that you had said that um, being mediocre is, and this obviously applies to what we were just talking about, medi being mediocre is much more enjoyable, much more fun than being at the top, being at the front. Um, mm. And I don't know what you do or don't know about me, but I was like an elite athlete and then I stopped and now I'm running very much like still same as you, like near the front, definitely can't call myself a middle of the pack runner, but like definitely nowhere near where it was. And I feel so much happier there than I ever did when I was putting my hands up winning tape and stuff. Um, and I'd love for you to speak to that because so many uh, everyday runners think that how could that possibly be the case when mm -hmm. you get all the glory, you get people cheering your name, you get like, you know, to the feeling of breaking a tape. Talk mm -hmm. to why you feel that is. Well, there's there's two, this is a long, complicated argument, but I'll give two elements of it. One is that um, if you think about it in the context of, not just the running context, but in the context mm -hmm. of lots of different things, that there, mediocre, mediocrity brings freedom. Mm -hmm. So imagine that you are, uh, so think about this in terms of where you choose to go to school. Um, one of the things that one of the fast and they have actually have an episode of revisions history this season devoted to in part to this observation. Um, most students who attempt to get a degree, undergraduate degree in uh, STEM, mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, math, mm -hmm. um, fail to get a degree in their chosen field because they drop the major before graduation. Right? Um, dropout rates in STEM are you know, roughly half, let's just say for the sake <laughs> of argument. But those rates are highest at highly selective schools. So this is the David and Goliath yes. concept. Yeah. So why are they higher? They're higher because even if you are really, really good at math, if you're in a classroom where everyone else is a genius, you feel like an idiot. Yeah. And so what do you do? You do the least rational thing imaginable. You drop out mm -hmm. because just because in that context mm -hmm. you feel dumb. Mm -hmm. And you fail to pursue the thing that made you happy. Had you gone to a school that was not selective, you would almost mm -hmm. certainly have gotten your degree. Mm -hmm. um, so the a mediocre environment is one that allows you to pursue what you love because mm -hmm. it doesn't crowd you out and make you feel. This is not just true of STEM. It's true of many, many, many things. I would sometimes work at a Bard college, and I would go up to it so many times, and I would sometimes watch the Bard lacrosse team. A Bard is, for those of you who don't know, a small liberal arts college half an hour from here. That really is known for like poetry and music and mm -hmm. film. And their lacrosse team, I was watching them practice. It's the worst lacrosse team I've ever seen about. Oh, I've had you say this, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that, it's, when you think about it, my first impulse was that's was to feel disdain. And then I realized, no, 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 that's amazing. Anyone can mm -hmm. play lacrosse. Mm -hmm. and, so that's the first reason. Mediocre is, mediocrity is great because it opens the door to everyone. And when I, went back into running, I joined what everyone, a track club where everyone in that track club would, media, would enthusiastically say they were a mediocre track club. And that was its greatest charm. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Um, and there was a culture that I realized was not just specific to my track club, but specific to lots of running, mm -hmm. which was, it was the most incredibly open and it is the most incredibly open and accepting culture that I've ever encountered. I don't think I've ever, I mean, nobody cares what you do, mm. how rich you are. They don't care whether you're skinny or overweight. They don't care whether you run nine minute miles or, in fact, everyone divides up. You just run with a group of people who run your speed. Mm -hmm. I never, in my running universe that I had had as a kid, which was totally elite oriented, we had disdain for anyone who wasn't yeah. speeding along at the front. Yeah. And then I went back and discovered, oh, there's a world of running yes. where nobody cares. Yeah. Like we're all just having fun running. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that was, it was literally, it is literally one of the greatest and happiest discoveries of my life. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to get back into running because I, I didn't know there was a path back in that didn't involve trying to win. Yeah. Because I had, my whole running experience was trying to win, right? As yeah. a kid. Yeah. Yeah. 
And when I stopped running as a kid, I quit. That was the great crisis of my running career. It was like, I couldn't conceive of why you would run if you weren't, didn't have a shot at winning. Mm-hmm. It didn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. I, I wasted 34 years of running because I didn't understand that the beautiful notion that it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so that's the, and then the other thing about mediocrity is mediocrity is the best. This is a more esoteric point. It's the best introduction to excellence. So I was talking to this comic. I was interviewing, uh, I was on, on a podcast of a, a kind of Mike Birbiglia, who's a very well known indie comic. Really, really, really wonderful, smart guy. And I was, t- we were talking about this and I was pointing out that like this thing that he didn't understand, which was when you're uh, in the audience to a comedy show, what you do is you go home and of course you tell your, you regale your friends with the jokes that you heard in the performance. Mm-hmm. But the important part of that is that you don't do it right. <laughs> right? You can't. You're not a comic. You give a bad version of yes. the joke, which is what allows the person you're telling the story to, to discover the real thing for themselves. If you were as good as the original comic in relaying the joke, mm-hmm. what you've done is you've closed off that experience to your listener. There's no reason for them ever to discover Mike Birbiglia because Malcolm can tell you Mike Birbiglia jokes with Mike Birbiglia skill, mm. but Malcolm can't. Malcolm's mediocre. So the implicit thing is, so imagine I'm telling you a Mike Birbiglia joke, Tina. You know that I am no good at telling the joke and you accept me for that mm-hmm. and you understand that what Malcolm's doing is not trying to make me laugh the way Malcolm laughed when he heard Mike Birbiglia. What Malcolm's trying to do is to say, you need to check out my Birbiglia. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm giving you an invitation. Okay. I'm not giving you a complete experience. And I think invitations are far more valuable and wonderful in life than complete experiences. It's not my job to go around, you know, cheating you out of the real thing. Mm-hmm. It's my job to get you excited for the real thing. Yeah. And the only way I can get you excited for the real thing is to be mediocre at giving the invitation. Right? Yeah. That's so... So then... To you, uh, more runners joining the running community is only going to, that's only a good thing. And it enhances the value. So my appreciation for watching like Diamond League races or the Olympic trials is, has increased tenfold since I became a mediocre runner. Mm -hmm. Cause now it, now their excellence means something to me. I'm like, holy sh**, those guys are fast, Mm -hmm. right? And I actually know how much that takes. Oh, wow. That, you know. I was watching Hobbs Kessler, okay. who's you know 18 years old, and a great hope in Amer- American male distance running. And I, you know, I remember what it was like to be running at that age, roughly. And he's so smooth and accomplished, and I mean, it's just like, and I just feel like when I, if I had watched him 30 years ago, I wouldn't have understood his genius. Now I kind of do because mm. I'm so, you know. 35 years ago, I would have said, well, I could be as good as that, which is my way of almost putting him down. Mm -hmm. Now I know I could never and I will never be as good as that. And that allows me to appreciate him for what he is, which is, you know, a wunderkind, a true wunderkind. I love that approach. And actually, I would challenge most people listening to to think about that. uh, Yeah, change in perspective. That's interesting. And from that same friend who asked me about this, he also said, could you not then apply the 10,000 hour rule and mm-hmm. say you need a 5,000 hour rule to be a mediocre runner? <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> to truly grasp your mediocrity. Yeah. I mean, like anything, you know, mediocre, to be mediocre is not the same as thing as being bad. Mm-hmm. It's a real distinction. Mediocre, I think being bad, I'm not, I don't celebrate being bad. Mm-hmm, I don't think mm-hmm, that's, mm-hmm. and I don't think you should, runners who are bad should train harder. Right? There's no do, you, do you feel that? that like, yeah. you think- there's no reason to do it if you're, there's no reason to play the piano if you're, if you can't play the song. Even if you enjoy it. I don't think, so here's where, let's use the piano example. Okay. My dad played piano medi- in a mediocre way his entire mm-hmm. life. It gave him great pleasure. He never, didn't play a lot, but he play, played enough that he could read music and play mm-hmm. Um, he would never be, you know, Horowitz. Um, but uh, he, if you listen to him, you could appreciate 
the music he was playing and mm -hmm. appreciate his limited but still real level of expertise. If he could only play the piano in a tuneless way mm -hmm. and in a way that he was stopping and starting and making multiple mistakes, that's not good for anyone. Thank you to Gooda for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. As I've said many times, you will be hard pressed to find a day I am not wearing Gooda. I wear them to run, I wear them around, I wear them to bike. Uh, my daughter likes to grab them and put them on her face. My daughter actually, my three-year-old, um, has loved sunglasses since she was pretty much six months old. And I genuinely think that's because both Steve and I always have gooders on our head that we are, that she sees it as the way people are, which is actually quite helpful having a child who likes sunglasses. But anyway, it is all thanks to Gooder. I also have a pair of Gooder, uh, my first pair of Gooder that I ever received. Thank you, Liz Kim, for that. Um, and the, uh, what do you call it? The glass bit, the frame, no, not the frame, the other bit, the glass bit, the bit that you look through. This is not a very good explanation, fell out. And um, so my daughter has those, uh, that pair. And by the way, she bashed it to death, which is why that fell out. But anyway, she wears that around just as her pair. So um, that's just another fun little thing. Um, Gooder is fun, fashionable, functional, and affordable. Uh, no slip, no bounce. They are polarized, which is just what we want. And they are fun. Every purchase of Gooder sunglasses is backed by a one year warranty. There are 30 day free returns. And so if you can, you don't like the color that you picked, you can return them and change them. They are a proud member of 1% for the planet since 2018, as is Running For Real. And if you do own a business or you do have the opportunity, 1% for the planet is an amazing organization to go check out. That means 1% of their annual gross sales go directly to environmental nonprofits working towards making our world a better place. Now, some of my favorites are a ginger's soul, and I also really like the uh, Midnight Ramble. Um, and there's all, they're always bringing out new colors, new styles that you can go check out and be using. Now you can get 15% off your entire order by going to gooder.com forward slash Tina. That is 15% off your order by going to gooder.com forward slash Tina. Your face is going to thank you and you will become like me, someone who is always wearing gooders. Thank you to Gooder. If he could only play the piano in a tuneless way mm -hmm. and in a way that he was stopping and starting and making multiple mistakes that's not good for anyone mm -hmm. and i don't think that's i don't think whatever if you get pleasure from that that's a, it's a diminished pleasure you need to need to be able to represent the music honestly mm -hmm. not expertly but honestly and similarly with running you know i sometimes see people running and they are their form is terrible they're struggling they're in pain they're I just think, you know, you need to take it more seriously. Like you can be a better runner. There's no reason you shouldn't feel like someone is, is, you know, like you're sitting in a dentist chair and getting drilled. Like it, it you, you know, it's, this is not a trivial activity. It's a serious activity. I'm not saying that you need to be able to run five minute miles. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that, um, anything you would like to do, um, with the aim of earning some pleasure, requires a certain degree of concentration and application. But you're not saying it has to be like, you're saying that someone could be like a brand new runner um, and they are struggling. They are in a lot of discomfort running 12 plus minute miles, um, mm -hmm. getting a mile and a half. You're not saying like that's... No, if you're yeah. on, a, on the road to somewhere, mm -hmm. that's fine. Mm -hmm. But my, and maybe these people I'm seeing are on the road to somewhere, in which case I... I take back my, but there are other people, I think, you know, I sometimes talk to people who like once every three weeks, they go out and they, um, you know, they're like, they're like not just, not just weekend runners, but they're like once a month runners. Mm. And it's clear the process is really painful and they're, it's like taking medicine for them and they feel some kind of guilted into, I just don't, that's not to my mind. Mm hmm a healthy way to run. So you're so you you're kind of referring to maybe the people during the pandemic who didn't do running because they wanted to do running because they wanted to be good at it because they wanted to get something out of it but literally like the gyms are shut I can't do anything else I suppose I'll do this and just suck it up and Yeah, I don't get like out. that attitude. I don't think that's you're you're 
it's a mistake to kind of, um, like I said, no, no, it's, it's about taking, um, I believe that people should take the things they um, pursue in life mm-hmm. seriously. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's fair. Um, so uh, on the note of backtracking a little bit, you backtrack in there a tiny bit, I would love to know how do you, with all that you know, all the knowledge you've yeah. you've gained, how do you keep yourself grounded and enough to stay curious to keep learning and maybe say like, oh, you know, I was I was wrong or I didn't know this or I don't know. Like, how do you like it must be quite hard when you've picked up all this and people call things Gladwellian, like to keep yourself reminded of I still need to keep learning. Sometimes I might have to say, you know, uh, I I take that back or whatever. Mm-hmm. How do you keep keep yourself on that path? Well, I actually think it's easier mm. for me to say I'm wrong than for uh, this stage in my life than it was mm-hmm. if I were not well known or had a. Mm. Um, because I, I mean, it's not like um, what's the best way to describe this. Yeah, uh, it's that I have a certain. If you've been, if you have an audience. Mm-hmm that you have built over time and that has a certain amount of loyalty to you um, uh, and that has been with you through all kinds of things, through all kinds of changes in your own opinions, Mm -hmm. through all kinds of previous starts and stops, um, has seen your maturation as a person, then I realized, oh, I'm not going to destroy my career by Mm -hmm. admitting I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Like... People are fine with that. Did you ever have a problem with that? Uh, well, there's a secondary thing, which is that I quite enjoy the feeling of being wrong. Because mm. I really love, I love the revision. It's my, my you know, I'm someone who's, who's addicted to revisions and changing my mind is one of my great, this is, I, to, my father, who was a, you know, um, uh, obviously, as, as, he, as fathers are for many of us, was the dominant figure in my life, is someone who loved nothing more than figuring out what he didn't know. It was his favorite thing in the mm. world. And was so would change his mind about something on a dime. Mm-hmm. Um, and his notion of the world was, he was a super rational, he was a mathematician, and he understood what he knew. He understood that there were really only three things in the world that he knew at an expert level, mathematics, the Bible, and gardening. It was an English. <laughs> um, he was something about dogs, but that was about <laughs> it. Um, but everything else, he was like, he had no pretensions whatsoever mm-hmm. about knowing. And he loved, as a kid, he, he would, um, when I was a kid, he would tease us constantly by pretending to know something that he clearly didn't. <laughs> and because he, he wanted to be found out. He wanted us to call bullshit on him. That was one of his favorite things. <laughs> And he would laugh uproariously. And it was, so I grew up with a model that said, discovering you're wrong is one of life's pleasures because mm-hmm. it's, the, it is the, it's the way you open the door to real knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, and backtracking is also pleasurable because you get to start over. Like, mm-hmm. what's better than that? Mm-hmm. Like, I agree. It's like, it's like a, um, you know, all of the things, um, it's this invitation to rethink Something. So, like all the rethinking of or discovering, discovery is where the pleasure is intellectually mm-hmm. in, in any area. And the sad thing about the perception that you know something with a degree of depth is that you're robbing yourself of the pleasure of discovery. Mm-hmm. You get mm-hmm. smaller and smaller and smaller mm-hmm. and smaller. But then when you find out you're wrong, you get the pleasure all over again. Mm-hmm. It's like a bonus. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So, on that note, I, um, about to ask you to potentially do that okay with okay so um talking to strangers i just want to say one of my favorite books of all time like i thoroughly enjoyed it listen Mm. listen to it twice which for everyone listening highly encourage the listening end of it um and you talk about defaulting to truth the whole book is about how we default to truth Mm. now i want to ask you um I haven't watched it, but there's a, you probably know where I'm going to go with this. There's a documentary um, about Alberto. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. In it, you were quoted, at least on the trailer, um, to saying that 
Mary should have known better, that her parents should have known. Her parents should have known. Okay, Not Mary. but then wouldn't her parents have defaulted to truth, especially him being a doctor and that's not his area. And mm-hmm. if they say that she's doing well and Alberto says that she is fine and that a sports psychologist says, who wasn't a sports psychologist, said she was fine, wouldn't they default to truth? And isn't that yeah. how you want things to be? Yeah, I mean, it's possible. Um I think you're probably right. Mm-hmm. And I think that was probably, probably did not come out the way I intended. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I would say I don't blame the parents for believing Alberta because we all, that's what we all yeah. do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I guess what I was react the, the sense of what I was trying to give is, and I didn't go into this because it didn't come up in the interview, is that I have a long standing aversion across many different disciplines to accelerated development. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're always in too much of a hurry to get where we want to go. Yeah. Um, And, you know, so for example... Me emailing you every month for like No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things like, for example, I was reading a lot this week, so I'm thinking of doing an episode on it. Mm -hmm. This is going to sound really nerdy, but it feeds into this. Okay. Is... Should uh, multivariable calculus be taught in high school? What ha- what happens in America is that a very very small number of elite high schools teach multivariable calculus to their seniors, mm-hmm. with the result that those kids go to colleges and know advanced calculus. Nobody else does, so mm-hmm. they make everyone else feel mm-hmm. like an idiot. Which enhances what yes. you were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. I was talking about now. And you can go further that the schools that teach multivariable calculus and give their students a head up uh, tend to be the wealthiest, whitest schools. Yeah. And, you you know, um, there, I feel safe to say there is probably not a single majority black school in this country that teaches multivariable calculus to high school seniors. Mm-hmm. There's that dimension. There's a second dimension, though, is there is no reason to teach multivariable high school to 18 year olds. No reason whatsoever. I don't even know what that is. It's like advanced calculus. (laughs) What is the reason why, you know, you need to know it eventually. Uh But there's no reason to learn it at 17. Yeah. You might as well learn it at 21 when you're more mature intellectually and you have a greater... What you really should be doing is building a foundation for all kinds of exploration of Mm -hmm. more sophisticated... Yeah, absolutely. Per David Epstein's Mm -hmm. point, Mm -hmm. early specialization is problematic. Um, in every conceivable realm. And when I read David's book, it radicalized me because I realized Mm -hmm. in the name of trying to enhance performance in many levels, we're actually screwing things up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was in that spirit, I guess what I meant in a very general way, and this is not specific to Mary Kane, but in a general way, I don't think, why are we rushing runners along? Why can't we just... and I would even go so fur- to further and say that the collegiate sports experience is also ridiculously sped up. Uh, yeah, yeah. And over, why can't we just? Why can't we just say our goal is to have people run happily in their mid to late twenties mm-hmm. and early thirties, mm-hmm. and just like put the brakes on. Mm-hmm. So when I said that about Alberto Salazar, he's part of the problem in the sense that he's not a. He's not someone who is constitutionally capable of putting the brakes on, mm-hmm. right? It's not a mm-hmm. not a guy who's put. He doesn't even know where the brake is, <laughs> right? Which is why he's a he's a great coach if you're 28, but I would say a terrible coach if you're 18, male or female. I just don't think that's the person who is ever going to have that. He's a maximalist. Mm-hmm. He's a um, so it was in that spirit that I was saying I wished that. Parents in general, not the Canes, parents in general who have promising kids mm-hmm. had, uh, it does take courage, had the courage to say, you know what, I'm going to l- slow things down. But do you think if you could put yourself in there, sh- like if the best coach in the world was approaching your daughter or like a, you know, someone you cared about, um, or if, if you think about it of you, the best coach, the one of the biggest brands in the world, like I don't know if I would be able to have said no to that if Alberto came to me like he, do you think you could have I hope I could have and I feel like after reading David's book I would feel a lot better about saying no mm. and I've known also I've known 
So one of my really, really good friends, and I have multiple friends like this, but I'll give you just one example, um, is my friend Di, who went to Stanford, swam at Stanford, was essentially a world-class swimmer. You have to be a world-class swimmer to be on the Stanford swim team. Mm -hmm. Now, and when you see her swimming, it is a thing of such incomparable beauty. I can't even describe, it doesn't look like swimming. Mm -hmm. It looks like it looks like a mermaid moving through the water. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. Mm -hmm. And she has this, just this beautiful, um, uh, the way she moves in the water is, is beauty personified. Mm -hmm. She does not swim now. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they beat it out of her. Yeah. Abs yeah. Right. Yeah. So I feel like knowing that would make me, I think if, um, as a parent, have the strength to say, no, you can't do that to my, you're not taking my 15 year old and putting her mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think now I can't say with hundred percent accuracy, mm -hmm. but when you add die story to numerous other stories, I know of people who got put through the ringer. I was just emailing with this guy who was, I call Ian Clark, who was a Canadian of my generation. He was the great distance mm -hmm. runner. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was third in the world junior cross countries or second, mm -hmm. like phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a ton of injury problems in his early twenties and basically like me started running 30 years later. Mm -hmm. Like I could, I could give you 10 stories like that, 15 mm -hmm. stories like that, from my own personal. So I think that plus David's book would maybe hopefully give me the strength to say no. But what about the default to truth element? Wouldn't you just be like, Oh, it'll, you know, I'm sure it, I'm sure it's a, he's a good guy. Like he's been emailing back and forth with the parent with her parents for months. Yeah. Like so, you know. Well, default of truth is not the same as being susceptible to every salesman who comes along, mm -hmm. right? It's contextual. So it's in the absence of other voices. Does one um, kind of uh, one voice with the. Uh, um, uh, with the with the appearance of expertise, have an unusually strong um, sway over me. That's mm -hmm. what people the truth is. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about something different. Is that if I was in a, what I'm describing is so well, coaches emailing with me about my promising young daughter. I have ten voices I can listen to. I'm mm -hmm. talking to my friend Di. My friend Di would flat out say, "Are you crazy? Mm -hmm. Look what they did to me! Mm -hmm. Right? I haven't gone near a pool." for 30 years because mm -hmm. they killed it. Mm -hmm. um, or, um, you know, this guy, Ian Clark, who would say running was my, he this email to me. He was talking about how to this day he is, he remains a runner. He's like, it's what I, he said, it's what I think about. It's the way I, you know, it's like mm -hmm. completely immersed in the sport, but they, he, because he was like rammed through at an early age, he just lost all of his most, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. these stories are heartbreaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel I have enough. One of the ways around to deal with default to truth is to populate your life with enough different voices and experiences mm -hmm. that you're not hostage to the to one seemingly persuasive one. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, that I think. The, yeah. Yeah. And I saw that all through growing up in England in the in the running because you know it's all through clubs over there, and I would see so many girls who were pushed so hard and they don't run now and. I remember being really mad at my coach. Like, why won't you let me do more than 20 miles a week? Why won't you let me do this? But now I do not have enough gratitude for Brad mm -hmm. for like for holding me back so that I could continue into it. So yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying there. And, and yeah, thank you for, for letting me bring that up there. And I would love to know then with you and your life and the default truth element, I mean, it partly, you just explained it there with surrounding yourself by people, but like, I mean, you must get people coming up to you in coffee shops. You must get people um, always like recognizing you. Um, how do you know which people to trust and which people like, do you ever feel like a connection with someone, even just someone who randomly comes up to you? Just, um, you know, how do you know who to trust in life and whether they just kind of want something out of you? Oh, well, I don't get a lot of my interactions with the public are, um, are overwhelmingly um, 
more than benign. They're like <laughs> pleasurable. They're not like, I don't. Okay. So you like, I don't know if you want to be saying you like people coming up to you. No, like, <laughs> I, want to, I want to tell you very respectful. Like, yeah, I don't get, you know, my Twitter feed is not full of people saying nasty things about me. Mm-hmm. It tends to be people just saying nice things about me. I mean, I don't know. Do don't, you know why that is, though? Because Twitter well, especially is... Twitter is... Well, I don't sort of globally search. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, I don't hunt you down. Don't know. I know there are people who say nasty things. I don't... But I'm not someone who... You know, I'm not very... Um, I'm not very thin-skinned. I don't really care what I do. And I'm... The pleasure of being as old as I am... I love, I love talking about that. <laughs> the pleasure of being as old as I am is that, you know, I'm over the hump on all that kind of crap. Like, I... Mm. You know, I you know, I'm fine. No mm-hmm. one's, you know, I don't, I don't need to prove myself to anyone. Or mm-hmm. and somebody can say nasty things to me, and it's just not going to make any difference, mm-hmm. right? It's fine. Um, so um, I wouldn't have, you know, when I was 25, I didn't have that. Thank God, I'm not 25 anymore. Right? Mm-hmm. So then you just. Do you do you ever get to know someone, someone who came up to you, and you just get like the whole default truth, like we can't. We're terrible at uh, talking to strangers. Mm. Um, is you would never know based on someone coming up to you whether that person could be someone you know you would like to get to know and spend time with. Do you mm. have you ever had someone come up to you randomly and just feel this like you know I'd like to talk to that person more? Or um, is it too short an engagement? To... I mean, I mean, I'm quite sh- sort of. I'm a little bit shy in public, mm-hmm. so it's unlikely mm-hmm. that I would have that reaction. Okay. Um, but I am naturally, one of the reasons the default to truth idea resonate with me is that I do trust people explicitly and automatically mm-hmm. and think that I accept the risk of occasional. I'm happy with the trade off of, I think the benefits to trusting everyone far outweigh the. The, the the very real risks of a, of occasionally being cheated. I'm fine with being occasionally being cheated. I don't, mm-hmm. It's like the cost of doing business. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Doesn't bother me. Um, I was reminded there's this hilarious guy named Brian who painted my house many years ago, and then I needed my house, my some rooms in my house to be repainted. So I called up Brian and he came. And when Brian was talking to me, he was like, "You know that last time when I when we first met, and I painted your house when I was finished." Rather than wait for me to give you a bill, you gave me a blank check. <laughs> did you? <laughs> I did. I said, did I really do that? He goes, yeah, you gave me a blank check. And uh, so I was like, oh, that's interesting. I was like, that seems, that's sort of very typical of the way I operate. I didn't think he was going to be, Yeah. I didn't know, but like, mm. he's not writing a check to himself for $100,000 mm-hmm. and going to Acapulco. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. he's just not. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. know. And if he did, well, then, you know, he's a criminal. I mean... <laughs> Um, and what you, you know, he was the man, I'd already let the man inside my yeah, house, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. When I wasn't there mm-hmm. for a week. Mm-hmm. So am I going to turn around and suddenly not trust mm-hmm. him now? It mm-hmm. seems crazy. So, so you see the best in people. Yeah. I mean, Brian, if you met Brian, you would also see the best. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's charming, but I don't, I, most, most people. And also a lot of, I feel like distrust is bred by distrust. Yeah. In other words, there's, mm-hmm. you know, so if you. Um, if you approach the world with an open mm-hmm, heart, I feel mm-hmm. like you you get a pretty good return. It's the whole example of people putting multiple padlocks, locking every piece of their bike up, like spending time making sure that it's exactly locked up. That's kind of you're almost inviting that in. Um, yeah, yeah, you're signaling that it's an expensive bike. <laughs> when I in the city, I would put my I would leave my bike outside, and what I did was it wasn't a thousand dollar bike; it was a Four hundred dollar bike, <laughs> but I would. I took all of these. Um, I made the bike look so terrible. Like I put multiple plastic bags <laughs> over there, and I put and I ripped off all the paint. Or no one ever took it because it just looked like trash. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the Running for Real podcast. Inside Tracker has been a friend of Running for Real and myself for many years now. I love to get my blood work checked with them. And you know what I really enjoy seeing? So each time you get it checked, they will do a uh, like a point for each on the graph of each of your uh, biomarkers. And you can see over time how things are changing. And they'll tell you if you're trending downwards, if you're trending upwards, 
or trending towards optimized or moving towards something that is at risk or something that needs work on, working on. Um, I really love to see my changes over time and see the areas that I've maybe been sucking in, but also the areas that I am doing better in. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Inside Tracker first. It is a comprehensive blood test, which you will find your local Quest diagnostics. And by the way, those are everywhere, uh, although US only. Um, you'll get, be able to get a detest, detailed analysis of 12 of your key biomarker, biomarkers. You will get a customized science-backed action plan based on your goals, and it will tell you which foods, supplements, and lifestyle changes you need to make to help you arrive in the optimal zone. It gives you ideas for meal prep, grocery lists, recipe guidance, and more. It really does have so much there. And for me, a few of my recent ones that were low, my vitamin D was low. So it told me, obviously we know about the sun, but it told me about which other things I could include in my diet that would help me to um, optimize that level, including a type of mushroom, which I didn't know about at the time. It gives you a lot more information if you want to go learn more about that. And there's also, uh, plenty of other little features within the website that you're really going to enjoy, or, or at least I do, if you enjoy learning. Now, Inside Tracker is giving our listeners 25% off, 25% yeah, off Inside Tracker. And you can get that by going to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina. And you will get that 25% off discount. It's going to be focusing on those 12 key biomarkers that are linked to overall wellness, metabolism, sleep, and energy. The essential plan is that catalyst that you are seeking to understand your body better. So go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina to learn more. I made the bike look so terrible. Like I put multiple plastic bags in <laughs> The, and I put and I ripped off all the paint. And I, no one ever took it because it just looked like trash. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And and why do that? Just so no one takes it. Well, I lost so many bikes to thieves in here. Okay, fair. And I, just I don't realized, know. Let's, that just, well. let's just make my bike look like. <laughs> A bike that's just not worse. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. Okay, I want to switch back to running here. So you've talked about, I think it was with Ryan Holiday, um, about um, you know you like to keep your work and your running separate. Mm. But even if you do that, you don't listen to podcasts. You don't, um, you know, you don't intend for that. Ideas are going to constantly be coming to you. So when you do have an idea or something like a an idea for an episode of revisionist history. Do you just kind of say like, shoo, I'll think about that later. Do you like make a mental note? Do you let yourself think about it? What do you do there when you get well, ideas? The idea isn't, doesn't generally come during the run. It comes really at all. after the run or mm. because of the run in a way I don't understand. I think the, I think running is central to my creativity, but not in a way that I, not, not in a way that I comprehend, I can mm. comprehend. And I don't get, so, I've gotten a ton of ideas waking up in the middle of the night. Mm. Um, in fact, that's a tried and true place where, um, so that model, I understand. Uh -huh. um, and I know that there's all this research on what your brain is doing in the middle of the night that allows creativity to happen. But um, with running, I'm just kind of trying to relax. You know, I don't want to be thinking about anything um, in particular, um, mm -hmm. or I'm just enjoying. Um, the process. So you kind of, I mean, that's pretty impressive if you kind of have that uh, meditative process. I mean, it's not that. But is, it's not that. I mean, I'm very intrigued. It's, it's just an unusual thing in the context of my day that mm -hmm. I would be doing something that's entirely physical. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about even my dad's generation, but, you know, our great grandparents' generation and our great great grandparents' generation and beyond. Mm -hmm. So much of their everyday experience was physical, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Most of them would have had jobs that were mm -hmm. some form of hard labor. Mm -hmm. um, so they are used to this notion of doing something uh, strenuous with their body. Yeah. Um, we're not. I sit at a desk all day. So it's just so novel for me to be doing something that's so um, cleanly and mm. specifically physical. That it's just... It's just unusual and kind of weird. And like, mm -hmm. and then you add to that the fact that you never know before you start a run how you'll feel during the run. I have never gotten over that kind of suspense. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Um, like I had a run the other day with some 
In fact, the same route we're going to run after this is over. Okay. I ran with this uh, son of a friend of mine, 21 year old. She had a really good run, a guy who should run more. <laughs> um, I tried to explain to him. Are you so, got to get him to listen to this. You explain it again about yes. the. Uh... <laughs> so it was Lucas. And I was like, Lucas, you should run. I was like, you should run more. He's a guy who probably runs three days a week. But mm -hmm. you know how this thing, and you're running with someone, and you look at them, and you, he runs three days a week, and you think. <laughs> If you um, could run six. Oh, my God, just run six. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you have it. Yeah. I mean, he has the stride, and he's relaxed, and he's graceful, and he's completely unruffled. And then the two of us sort of got in. He said, we're going to run slightly uphill for four miles and mm -hmm. then slightly downhill for oh, four miles. Right? Um, that doesn't lend into a uh, into an even pace run here. No, no. So we went out <laughs> in a very, we're chatting quite happily. And then on the way back, we both, without saying anything, decided to kind of run hard. And I just mm. felt fantastic. But I, you know, I could not have predicted that feeling. Yeah. So it is that, that idea that you never know how you're going to feel mm. that's so addictive to me about mm -hmm. running, you know, the... The uncertainty of the experience is it's is it is is it's um is um is its appeal to me. Yeah, yeah. I actually I think that's kind of what we all strive for. And I wonder you you've said that you tend to run in the afternoon as we're about to do here. Do you think any part of that is the fact that you are working all day and kind of almost expending all that mental energy and then had you been running, do you find the same thing with the morning? Or like because you've got run. I, but I don't. The hey, you were going to say you were going to run tomorrow morning potentially. Did I say that? Yeah. Oh, is the Tuesday working in the morning? Yeah. Oh, I'm not morning. I'm doing Friday morning in the afternoon. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I don't. I'm a. I, I can't. You never run in the morning. Never. Ever. I, unless I, if I have to race in the morning, which is just even just makes my life miserable. Um, <laughs> no, I can't. I mean, it's because morning is so productive. Uh, yeah. For my work. Um, and, uh, I just feel, I don't know. I've just always mm -hmm. run in the evening. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I would run after supper mm -hmm. on, in Canada, to get into winter, I would run, I, I would go to like nine at night, pitch black, mm -hmm. freezing cold. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the greatest experiences in my life. They're just like no cars anywhere. Mm -hmm. And you're just running on some frostbitten. And, and then in high, in college, I would run one, it was one year, my junior, me and this guy named Paul Reed, we inverted our sleep schedule and we'd run at three or four in the morning through downtown Toronto in the winter. And that, those are the most magical runs I've ever been on my life. Mm. Like eight or nine or 10 miles and you would not see a single soul. Yeah. And it would be, you know, minus 15. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it would be a hard crust of snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. It was just, I mean, it was... I still remember it was so fantastic. And I was 20, 19 years old. So, you know, at my, that was my running, since I quit shortly thereafter, my running peak. And, you know, as you're running after, at that age, you just run forever. Yeah. Know? It's yeah. just effortless. Yeah. It, I mean, uh, those are some of the most special runs, especially, like you said, when it's really cold um, and you just got it done and... I mean, the feeling, especially after those really cold runs, is some of my favorite. Like, I lived in yeah. Michigan for five years, and um, um, it was just like a real, like, building mental toughness, but also just a real accomplishment and, yeah, just enjoyable, like, seeing your breath just in and out as you yeah. conquered these, yeah. Well, the rain, the British rain run is one of my favorites. The drizzle? The drizzle run. Mm. Drizzle runs are a <laughs> I was in I was in London a couple of years ago. Is it Victoria Park? What's the? It's the park. Is it? Is there a, there's a Victoria Park in the mm -hmm. east. Oh, I'm not going to be able to tell you this part where where things are. Oh, um, <laughs> I went out on a cold, what a cold, damp, drizzly mm -hmm. November mm -hmm. English days, mm -hmm. and did intervals in I think it's Victoria Park, um, and so much fun. It's like fantastic. It was like it is good running weather for sure. <laughs> fantastic definitely. running weather. Yeah, yeah, perfect. yeah, that is that is good. Um, on the you know, I just said about mental toughness side. Um, I'm just going to bring in a few talking to strangers things that I wondered about applying to to running ideas here. That um, so you talked about um, you know the the military interrogation, um, which obviously I'm not ap applying that mm. part to it, but um. 
In terms of toughness, like with runners are so used to pushing through pain to dealing with thoughts saying, you know, this is uncomfortable on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Just curious for the runners out there. Do you, do you feel like runners have some level of, because it is the punishment of other areas and because we're so used to that, uh, our comfort day to day that when that runners build a level of, yeah, strength, toughness, whatever it is, that that's maybe, you know, not ahead of people who are used to, who are like the level you were talking about with interrogation, but tougher than the average person. Well, I'd make a distinction <laughs> between discipline and toughness. Okay. Um, I think running builds discipline. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced it builds toughness. Okay. So, you know, when I think of toughness, I think of people who run marathons or marathons is the only category where I would say that's genuine toughness. Ultras, cyclists, um, you know, uh, people who are doing insanely sustained um, levels of high levels of physical activity mm -hmm. that I will, you know, Des Linden w winning the Boston marathon in the rain. That's toughness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like everybody else folded. She didn't. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So my hat is off. That's a very specific thing. Yeah. But what running I think teaches is discipline, which is just the notion that in order to do it well, you have to do it on a regular basis, week in, week out, mm -hmm. for years. Mm -hmm. And that, so just like, you know, to play the piano well, require, or the violin well, or any number, there's all these kinds of, there's a series of tasks in life which require that kind of um, uh, steady application of time and effort. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to make space for it and you have to overcome your own reluctance and excuse making and all kinds of things um i actually am much more interested in discipline than toughness okay and i'm much more in, as a kind of general trait i think discipline is more important than toughness i don't think i mean toughness helped desmond and she's totally tougher than everybody else mm -hmm. but most of us are not mm running them in position to win the Boston Marathon, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Most of us are not going to be, you know, an infantryman in the, the war. Yeah. We're not going to be, you know, like these are not, most of us never need, and there's no, when I think about this, we're in my um, uh, companies, um, my audio companies offices here. When we hire people, I'm not looking for toughness. I don't care. Yeah. I'm looking for discipline though, mm -hmm. right? So the idea that somebody has been a runner um, is it is important because it tells me something about their mm. willingness to tackle mm -hmm. um, in a persistent, focused manner mm -hmm. a complex task. That's super useful to me. Yeah, I don't need to know whether they can run a hundred miles. That's yeah, not, um, uh, like one of my, uh, you know, we have a lot of two of the most important people in this world are, well, actually more than two. When I look at our company, it's just a little company, but many of our most important people are moms in their late thirties and early forties. Are your like audience? Who are, who work here. Oh, work here. Okay. And the thing you know about, if you meet someone who's 45 and has three kids, you're aware that they can handle a certain degree of complexity, right? It's just like, it just, it, it just, you, you don't have to worry that they're going to flake out. And sure mm -hmm. enough, these people, like, you know, one of my producers is this. She has two kids. She's in her mid 40s. And she's like, you can't phase her. I mean, she's just been through and emerged from all of the kind of challenges of that stuff. So she has a certain amount of toughness, but she has discipline. She, like, raising a child requires a huge amount of discipline, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, so physically demanding that most people can't do it, but it does build in you a certain amount of like resilience. And mm -hmm. um, so that's like, that kind of stuff matters. I mean, I think there's a reason we keep hiring these women in their 40s, like mothers in their 40s, mm -hmm. like they're as a sort of sample, as a kind of cohort, mm -hmm. they're like pretty ideal. Mm -hmm. Like not a lot of duds, people who've pulled that off with any degree of success, there's not a lot of duds in that group. Um, 
you know, that same thing as hiring someone who's 22 when you've just no mm-hmm. idea. I mean, mm-hmm. A flake it can't be a flake if you've got two functional children in, in middle school. Right? What about women, uh, women in the thirties with two kids? <laughs> well, I think it's, <laughs> I would say the same thing. <laughs> say, you know, it just so happens that the group in our company, tend yeah, to be, yeah. they're in there. I'm thinking about this, 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 this group of women is, um, that they all have, yeah. they're incredibly disciplined, right? Yeah. They have to be. Okay. So I would love to talk about that a little bit then, because I did not know that. So you just said about, um, you know, m- most of your team, what do you call mm-hmm. them? Uh, women, um, with kids. So mothers, um, when I look up a lot of like podcasts that you're on or, um, even your like tweets and things, I, I don't see a lot of women and I'm not saying that you, mm-hmm. you know, do something wrong, but like, you know, seeing how, like you've just said, how strong these women are, how disciplined they are, how they can, they're resilient, they get through tough things. Like, what do you see your role as in changing things so that the world is a more friendly, like with the power that you have mm-hmm. with your platform? Like, how do you see, how yeah. is, what's your role here? Well, I mean, it, I think I do, like anyone with a platform, I do have a role to play. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I would push back gently against okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, so for example, this season, we do keep a running count okay. of who, for example, in revisions history, who's showing up in our episodes. So you're, who you're having on. Yeah. Yeah. Who are we using? Um, who are we interviewing? Who are we in court? Whose stories are we telling? Mm-hmm. And if you look at the f- all six seasons, mm-hmm. including this season, mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually quite proud of yeah. what a diverse group. Yeah, yeah. This season in particular is over. We are over. It's overwhelmingly female voices. Mm-hmm. Now you can't do that every season. Some, if you want to tell, like you know, one season we want to tell a lot of civil rights stories. Mm-hmm. We're telling some stories about the civil rights movement from the '60s. You just, you're just, it was a function of the time and the nature of that movement that there were not a lot of female voices. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you can't do everything all at once. Mm-hmm. So you pick your spots. This season, um, for whatever reason, many of the stories that I wanted to tell allowed me to bring in female mm-hmm, voices. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a, uh, and I have been alerted by my team to the necessity of doing that. It is absolutely the case that if I did not have women on my team pushing me, mm-hmm. um, I would not have done nearly as good a job as mm-hmm. of expanding, you know, um, the range of voices you default to the to the stories you know yeah. and you're comfortable with you know mm-hmm. um so um that's and one of the things we always talk about at pushkin is that the reason we try to pursue a diverse workforce is we think it makes the it's not because we think it looks better or that we're fulfilling some kind of social function mm-hmm. but because we think it makes the work better absolutely yeah, yeah. um yeah. and so we and i have absolutely seen that mm-hmm. um that mm-hmm. my the work, particularly the revisions history, it's so much better for having. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a my team is more f- female than male. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but in my books, sometimes it's harder and you just well, I'm trying to think. Uh, I mean, I was more referring to just like, yeah, I, and I did, I yeah, I wasn't really saying like your 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 podcast. Like, I know that you do mm-hmm. have a diverse um, mm-hmm. range of people. I was more meaning like. There's so many male podcasts that have like the big podcasts that you, I mean, you're on this podcast oh, here, but like, yeah. there's so many male voices. Like, how do we balance yeah. that out? Um, yeah. Yeah. What is your, um, I think it will happen. I mean, for when I think about the ones I've been doing to promote the upcoming season of revisionist history, they've been actually for the first time, to your point, mm-hmm. they've been more female than male, but it's because of the, we have, we're tackling subjects this season that have more and more female voices in mm-hmm, them. Mm-hmm. Um, like we're doing, sounds silly, but it's not, but we're doing three episodes on fixing the little mermaid movie. <laughs> okay. And, um, and that, you know, so that, that series is overwhelmingly female voice. Cause we're dealing with how to rescue the character, the characters of Ariel and Ursula, okay. two female characters. Um, and in promoting those episodes, I've done a lot of, I've been going on female or, mm-hmm. oriented mm-hmm. podcasts. Mm-hmm. So that, but you know, my book that just came out, The Bomber Mafia, I mean, 
it's you know there's one female voice in the entire book because mm-hmm. I'm talking about Air Force bombing in World War II. Like mm-hmm. it's just and if when you go and promote that, you're not promoting that on you know mm-hmm. Oprah's podcast, mm-hmm. right? You're promoting mm-hmm. that on. I'm about to do one next week. This literally called like it's like the most male podcast of all time. It's like you know guns and stuff. literally it's like <laughs> it's just some kind of but like so it just it's just it just depends on what direction you're but you, that is a conscious thing that you are thinking about and your team is thinking about oh all the time mm-hmm. good um and we and i will you know my one of my producers mia will tell me mm-hmm. she'll say oh we're the women here mm-hmm. or I, have, I feel a lot more comfortable you know us spending more time with this character than that character okay just because it um and it's it is it is um made a big difference was that hard for you at any point to like when she started saying that or were you just like yeah actually that's fine well we it's why we hired her okay. so way back when when my, jacob and i who founded this company we were looking for a producer for revisionist history uh, we were interviewing these i've told the story guys but it's hilarious we were interviewing all these candidates and one of them was this woman mia and mia i never met you before I'd never done a podcast before, it was like before I even started the first season. Mm. And we gave the candidates a list of the story ideas. And Mia, for this first season that I was thinking of, and Mia, the first thing she said in the interview was, if you guys do your show on these ideas, no woman will ever listen to revisions history. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, really? <laughs> we need to hire you. <laughs> so we did. And she, we wanted, you know, that was the reason I wanted her. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that she saw that from the very beginning and said it to you, right? And yeah. said it to me, yeah, was incredibly important to me because mm-hmm. I there's it is pointless to have people a who, um, if you have if the people who are working with you just agree with you all the time, a that's pointless, and b if the people you work with are afraid to say things to you, that's pointless. Mm-hmm. So she had to be different. And she had to have some guts mm-hmm. and she is both different and has guts. And that's, that's awesome. uh, that made a big difference. That's good. Thank you for, for indulging me in that. I was, I'm just, that's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, final question for you. Well, actually, why don't you go and tell the listeners about the Bomber Mafia? Cause I have not read that one yet. Oh. So it's just so, you know, they know what it is. It's, um, well, it was intended. It's, it's an audio book first and foremost, which we did a print version, but it's really the audiobook is the prize. Mm-hmm. It's the story of a group of um, pilots in Alabama in the 1930s who, are, who think they can reinvent war so that war will be have a fraction of the casualties and mm-hmm. be over quicker. And, and they carry this dream of how to reinvent war into the Second World War. And they come close to pulling it off and they fail. Mm-hmm. And it's a story of this quixotic dream of mm-hmm. this group of pilots um, and how it, it ends in the bloodiest, most kind of morally appalling campaign of the entire war, mm-hmm. which is the war against Japan in the mm-hmm. summer of 1945. Um, and it's a departure for me. It's not my usual, usually mm-hmm. I tell 10 stories at once. Mm-hmm. This is one story. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it's just this kind of picture of this. We have all the tape of these guys from mm. 70 years ago, and we have, it's all about crazy planes and Winston Churchill. And, you know, it's just a kind of, it's a, it's a yarn. Um, and we are, we think the audiobook is the best audiobook we've ever done here at mm. Pushkin. It's, it's okay. really something. It's a, it's an experience. Um, okay. Okay, I'm sold. All right. So then on behalf of the running community, as this is the question they've probably been waiting all, for all episode, as well, we're speaking about departure from your usual, mm. when is the running book coming out? Oh, God. <laughs> I have a running book. I've been dying to do a podcast episode on running, mm-hmm. and I can't figure out. My problem is all the things, there are, there are two things I care about almost more than anything else. Cars, oh, running. Interesting. Those are my two great loves. Okay. Um, and I am incapable of writing about those two subjects. I don't know why. I just don't know what to say. I'm like overwhelmed by. It's part of the problem is when you know too much about a subject, it paradoxically gets much, very hard to mm. tell stories about it. But two is you become very aware of how much better the existing pool of writers is at 
representing that world than you are. So, um, so I've but surely I've, there's some social science element to running, like the like ancestral, like how people, you know, how running is tied so closely to human beings. Is that I has that been good. covered? Yeah. I mean, I guess I maybe born to run. Yeah, yeah, it's been no, everything. I mean, I would love to have written David Epstein's last book, but he wrote his last <laughs> book. I would love to have written the book he wrote before that, but he wrote it. So, I mean, what am I going to do? Like, everywhere, everywhere I turn. Go but, steal his notebook, see what I'm he's working this. on next. <laughs> I always ask him, what are you working on, David? Like, you know, and he's always savvy enough not to tell me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I don't know. I would love to do it somehow. I'd love to communicate to non-runners the beauty and joy of running race um mm -hmm. i don't know how to do it um oh so it isn't that you have an idea like i, I think know. i and uh, many others probably thought it's it's there it's just maybe you're like oh, i'm gonna write a running book and your agent's like mm, I don't know, I can't. yeah <laughs> no no like there's i can't the thing is i can't communicate there are certain runners who when i watch them i just get so excited and I'm almost nervous on her behalf because mm. I like Laura Muir. Mm -hmm. I just think Laura Muir is like the most, mm -hmm. when she puts the hammer down, mm -hmm. I'm like, it's just like electric. I'm yeah, just like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. like um, I don't know how to, I wish I could find a way to communicate to someone who's not a running fan that, that like what she's doing and how to get invested in her and why that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, or, you know, uh, you know, this kid Cole Hawker, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's just like, it's just bananas. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just crazy. Like, mm -hmm. what are you just want to, you know, like, so these people who have this kind of charisma that is, um, that I, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't know how. Well, I, if anyone can figure it out, it's got to be you. So um, we'll wait for well, it as I'm long as it done, takes. Yeah, <laughs> well, if you've only been rerunning again, or re race, re hard working, uh, hard workout ing again for seven years. Maybe you just got to make it to 10 years and then yeah, the yeah. inspiration will come. Um, thank Malcolm, thank you so much for joining me, for inviting me to your studio and, uh, yeah, sharing some insights with us and, yeah, hopefully a bit of a different interview to usual. So thanks for joining me. Thank you, Tina. Before we end this episode, I just want to take a moment to shout out my podcast editor, Jeremy Nessel, who has done such a wonderful job of looking after my podcast, taking out all the mis mishaps in the episodes while still keeping in the, the vulnerability and the realness and the rawness of the conversation. This is not one of those podcasts where I take out the ums and the errs and the, the, sometimes the delay in, in words, because I think it's very important to keep that authenticity. We're surrounded by perfected and manicured everything. And I think it's really important that running for real stays that way. So thank you to Jeremy for your work. I also want to thank Maria Vargas and Amber Moore, who are also part of my team. They've been a big part of this community and me being able to build this brand. So just want to give them a shout out too. All right, let's get right back to the end of this episode. Well, friends, what did you think? I am really proud of myself for that interview. I feel I was totally engaged and listening and paying attention. It was a lot more relaxed and casual than maybe other episodes that we have had. I know I was making uh, agreeing sounds maybe a bit more than I normally would, um, but I wanted it to be that way. I mean, he's had so many interviews over the years. I just wanted to do something where it was just two people, dare I say friends, chatting. Um, and I'm also proud of myself for pushing on a few things, uh, challenging him. And there were a few moments in there where I was getting ready to ask particularly about the the Mary Kane thing. And my heart was pounding. I could feel it pounding as I got ready to say something. Um, but I'm really proud that I did. And it was an incredible opportunity. The run was amazing with Knox, Malcolm and I. And uh, if you go look at Malcolm Strava, you can see a picture that we took that was his suggestion, which is just really funny. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening today. If you are a new listener, I hope you continue to check out some of the other episodes and all the other things we have going on at runningforreal.com. And I want to take a moment to thank each of our sponsors and tell you to go check them out. Thank you to Athletic Greens. Um, I've been taking Athletic Greens for years now to get on my trip to New York. You can go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to get yourself that one year free supply plus some extra bonus travel packs with your order. 
You can also go to uh, gooda.com, that's G-O-O-D-R.com forward slash Tina, gooda.com forward slash Tina to get yourself 15% off a pair of Gooda glasses. After my beasting, I was wearing my Goodas pretty much nonstop until I went to bed um, just because my eye was so swollen and puffy. And finally, thank you to Inside Tracker for helping me keep track of my insides and check on how everything is doing. I mean, the name speaks for itself, right? You can go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina to get yourself 25% off their store. That's 25% off. That's a limited time offer only. So go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina. Thank you so much for listening today, my friends. We have another Together Run on Monday. If you don't know what a Together Run is, go check them out. People are loving them and uh, I'm really enjoying it too. So thank you so much for listening. I will see you on Monday. 